right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm D.A. All right, now we're live. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deanne D. Matthews, and I want to thank you for joining me today. This is concept discussion number two for black, white, and red. Let me get this glare off. Black, white, and red all over my new uh, release my fourth book is now at the moment on Amazon free for you to download an ebook form and it will be it's a discounted paperback until midnight tonight on August 23rd it goes back up to the regular price so after today if you see this after August 23rd it will both the ebook and the paperback will be up again to the regular price but I'm going to continue to promote this through September because at any price there are concepts in this book that if you are a freedom loving person in the United States of America this book will be not only an engaging story for you but also worth your time to grasp some of the concepts however I am not one of those people that thinks that if you don't buy my book the value is not for you so I'm doing I did some chapter readings last week and into this week I did three reading the first and second chapters and this week we're going to look at some of the concepts because there are real things I write about real things by means of fiction so a couple of the real things that you should know about for example this book starts with a newspaper, a black newspaper, that has decided to exercise its rights to find out exactly what the police are doing by, by putting forth a Freedom of Information Act request, or more like a demand. It's a federal law that allows you to get information from any publicly funded organization. You show up with a request, and unless there's an active investigation going on, the records have to be turned over. The book sort of runs around, okay, so that's what the law says, but are the police actually going to comply? So that's sort of the, the background of the book, which brings us into the concept for our discussion today. I posed a question on Facebook yesterday. What does a good cop look like? We know what we don't want, but have we ever discussed what we do want to see in policing? And black, white, and red all over goes around this issue in a couple of ways. But it also goes around the issue from the fact that in the United States of America, this is not a conversation that we have often. I think we do know what we don't want. I think that if you are a freedom-loving person with human decency and compassion, we don't want any more of Derek Chauvin murdering George Floyd in nine and a half minutes with his knee on his neck. I think we know we don't want that. I think we don't want retired police officers and their sons and their friends hunting down men like Ahmaud Aubrey on their morning jogs like they are dogs just for the out being black while enjoying a jog in their own neighborhood. I think we know we don't want that. I think we know that we don't want police departments to be so cavalier about their attitude when they're doing investigations that they don't call someone to tell them that someone else is in custody so that Breonna Taylor is shot in her bed with the police searching for someone that they already have in custody. I think we know we don't want that. I think we're pretty clear that we don't want Darren Wilson shooting Michael Brown in the back and saying, well, I did that to protect the community. No, you murdered a member of the community. Now, he was acquitted, so we have to say he killed him, but we know what that was. We don't want Walter Scott shot in the back as he's running away. We all know what we don't want. I saw another video today from June. Black man was surrendering, had his hand up here on his head, and was drop kicked in the behind by a white police officer just to be able to make up an incident where they could say he resisted arrest. The thing was, it was recorded, so we know what happened. And you still have people here saying, okay, well, what was the rest of the story? I'm like, what else do you need to see? Okay, but we all know what we don't want. One of the things that I attempt to put forward as I write, I do not write black people or white people from a pure victim perspective. It is so common for people to be in a victimized role. Either you know, something is done to someone and then all they can do is react to what's done. No, I make it a point 
And in later books, you'll see this even more. I have a Civil War series, that, for example, where normally when black people in Civil War stories and even the way the history is told are just waiting in slavery patiently to be released. No one talks about the 180,000 United States colored troops that both Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant said were better than their white troops, more loyal and more effective, that they provided the margin of victory. No, I don't write us sitting around having the emotional responses of being a victim. I don't write that. What I write about is for us to begin to know how to ask for the things and even demand the things that we want and powerfully communicate those things. In our first concept discussion, we talked about the triple injustice. It's referenced on page 69 in the paperback. And of course, I don't know where it would be in the Kindle, but it is in chapter three where Captain Hamilton talks about it's not only just an injustice to a black family when you arrest an innocent man a woman out of that family, but it also does an injustice to the victims because they think they're getting safety and closure and they're not, and that also leads criminals to run through the community. We even added a fourth level by which if you do this long enough, everybody loses confidence in the criminal justice system and therefore in the authority of the governing powers we have chosen to have over us. So you do at least three levels and over time four levels of damage when you pick up black men and abuse them and let other criminals just run free. So that was the first concept discussion. This concept discussion is about, okay, what does a good cop even look like in search of a good cop? This is not something we've often talked about from a positive direction of what should we be asking for? Now I need to say something else here because there is a lot of silly propaganda. And yes, I said silly propaganda on this whole concept of defund the police. But I'm not necessarily talking about the silliness of the people that say that just yet. Because those who disagree with this and go off into their ideations about Marxism and communism don't have a piece of history that's important. Black people were being policed as if they were pieces of property going astray when they were trying to get free like all human beings are entitled to 150 years before Karl Marx picked up his pen. So for those who do not agree with some of the, I'm not a complete agreement with the Black Lives Matter organization, but don't miss the point. Those who do not agree for black people agitating for serious reform and policing, understand we come from a community that for 246 years, 12, 13 generations, our very movements were policed because we were presumed to be someone else's property. And it didn't matter where in the United States you were. Because of the Fugitive Slave Act, all law enforcement everywhere in the United States could walk up to any black person and ask, what are you doing here? Are you contraband? And could take this person into custody and take them back down south. And because the bounties were big enough, occasionally people who were free were picked up and taken into slavery. Perhaps you've heard of the movie 12 Years a Slave. This was a free black man who ended up in slavery. The bounties were big. So because those bounties were large, any black person at any time across the United, from coast to coast, across the United States could be picked up and taken somewhere against their will and put off into slavery and all existing law enforcement in the 1840s and the 1850s right up to the Civil War participated in this because of the Fugitive Slave Act. I bet you didn't know that, did you? Some of you do, but those of you who are out there who think that the police operate like dragnet or are always fair like T.J. Hooker, no, this was the situation for black people before Karl Marx picked up his pen. So when people are saying defund the police, maybe they don't have all the details laid out, but we are standing together to say that this kind of policing black people as either they are property or now just a threat to other people's property and that there are only certain places that they're allowed to be, that has to stop. And eventually over the course of time, it will stop one way or another. But what would be wonderful to happen is if we can do this in a way that actually is not destructive to the entire body politic. It is not necessarily a good thing to not have police 
when you need help. The winter that's coming is going to be very challenging for a lot of reasons. But at the same time, there are people living in communities that every time the police come in there, it is going to be to jack somebody up. That's their whole life experience. And there are black people that have had that life experience for 20 generations now. But that still doesn't bring us to the question of, okay, we know what a bad cop is. We know what bad policing is. If it falls into the line of the same old thing, now what? Well, again, it's not a conversation that we've had. So we're sort of even here kind of breaking new ground. Now, that being said, I know some good police officers, white and black. I've had, I've known a few police captains in my, not in my neighborhood, my church's neighborhood. They'll come over to the church. They'll meet. They'll hear the most incredible things. I remember I told one police captain that um, there had been a shooting of a black, young black man in the city. And I told him, I said, sir, we just need to know what side you're on. Are you on the side of the old slave patrol or are you going to do what's right? And he listened to us for a long time and I remember he had tears in his eyes it really hurt him to understand the community's viewpoint but then I'm gonna have to say this he went out and he did better um our captain presently is someone who not only comes to our church from time to time but loves, but brings his children and fellowships with us for real so there's some reasonable police officers police lieutenants officers I've known several and some of the young men that I grew up with but they were a little older than me they became good police officers and they were black so it does happen the question is what are we even looking for human decency and compassion would be a good start another thing that goes into this is you have the overlay between when we've had about 30 years of war off and on from George H.W. Bush's president through George W. Bush's president, Iraq and Afghanistan. So you've also got this situation of people who have gone to war against mostly brown skinned people for 30 years needing to come back and having employment. And when you have a situation like that and then you put them in black and brown communities PTSD tends to assert itself. Not only that, police are paramilitary. They're not a military force per se, although there's a lot of conversation about them becoming increasingly militarized. But the idea is you protect your buddies from the enemy. So then you take a lot of veterans that are coming back. I even knew a young police officer who was going to pay for police academy through the GI Bill. So he was going to go to the army and then come back and become, and I said, now when you come back here, you just have to understand, I'm not your enemy, even though I look like a lot of the people that you're gonna be out fighting against. So if you do come back here, we need you to understand that just because we have a black, just because you have been sent by the US military to fight largely brown skinned people across the world, when you come back, you have to be able to switch that off. But then you gotta look at, okay, then police officers need to have resources if they come from that background to work their way into, into coming out of that mindset of brown skin enemies and we protect the group against all these brown skin enemies. This is what happens when you have a lot of veterans who are looking for work on the police force. By definition, we've had a war for 30, we've had war off and on for 30 years. This is part of the issue that's going on. But part of it also has to do police because of what they are, our sort of fraternity, the blue line. So it's very difficult for people inside of this who wake up every day with a fear that we, in a way, a police officer wakes up and he's on the beat in certain neighborhoods has the same fear that we have. Many black men fear that they're not going to get home alive because they're police officers in the neighborhood. Well, you know, you don't really sit on the neck of someone till they're dead just for hate. A lot of police officers are terrified. I was with a black male friend of mine when he was stopped. There had been a law change on that particular street in San Francisco and you couldn't drive in certain directions at certain times. The police officer was shaking. And so was my friend. And so everybody kept their hands where they could see them. But the police officer, gun, baton, taser, all this, 
terrified of this big, beautiful, chocolate-skinned black brother. Three time war vet, the Vietnam War veteran, three tours. All he was doing was sitting in his car with his hands up here. This officer was terrified. And this goes back to the whole idea that you look at American history and you realize something. All that was done to control the behavior of black people had to do with the fact that the people who had us in slavery were terrified that at some point, because we were physically superior, we could do work they couldn't do. And they knew that if we were allowed learning, we would also, you know, you look at the things invented by black people. We were not intellectually behind that eventually we would be even with them. And because we had done the work for so long, we would jump out ahead of them. And then you just have the fact that, again, men measure themselves by their physical attainments. Black men were bred for strength. It's what happened for 13 generations. This is why your athletes, your superior athletes to this day, physically. So you get into a physical conf confrontation with someone who is actually genetically superior to you as a white man. That's a whole different conversation. These are things that go on that we don't talk about. A good cop, we would think, would be secure enough in who he is and the right he has come to do not to let his fear cause him to do something he doesn't need to do. Now, let me tell you another story that goes with this. The neighborhood I was born in had a crack house when I was born, five doors down. And it's a grief of mine to my family to this day because the people involved had grown up with my mother and it's difficult it was difficult for her generation to watch so much of her generation lose itself to crack okay. So it was a very different neighborhood then. But even now, after gentrification, if two black people are stopped, I actually recorded this on Facebook Live. I stood there for an hour because two little black people not large people. I mean, small, younger black people were taken out of their car. By the time I got there, I don't know what the reason was, but the car had been completely searched and then was eventually impounded and the black people had to walk away. But I was there to make sure they walked away alive because they sent, the local station sent four police cars. Now, eight officers. Now, we got two black people unarmed, already controlled. Each gun holds about six to nine bullets. I'm not up on my calibers, but let's just make it six. That's 48 bullets for two black people that are already restrained. So even today in this gentrified neighborhood where there are very few of the black residents that I remember left, this overwhelming response to, oh my gosh, we have black people in custody, we need to bring out deadly and overwhelming force. You would think that a good cop and good departments would realize excessive force is not necessary. But in the end, to design this person that we want to see, we're talking about also having designed different kinds of citizens of the United States that really do not exist in the main. For a man to be a good cop, he must be secure in his manhood and therefore not intimidated by other men who may be physically bigger, not be intimidated by even all the long history that makes it make people think that black people have all these scores to settle. There are 40 million of us in the country. If we had wanted to settle certain scores, we would have especially in states where during slavery, we outnumbered the people there. People like Nat Turner never had a majority of the people around him that went out and actually killed slave owners and their families. They never had a majority. Now there were, and it's not recorded in history, hundreds of slave rebellions, but it was never what it could have been. There were some slave states that were overwhelmingly African in, in its composition, but it was we were not the ones that came with the violence. We were not the ones that came with the opportunity, the idea of reducing other people's lives to chattel. We didn't come with that. 
let the record show. And that's still not where most of us are today. So a good cop, you would think, would have to be secure in his own manhood so that if a black person says something to him or looks at him a certain way, he doesn't necessarily need to feel like he has to avenge his manhood or protect himself. He's not intimidated. He knows what he's here to do. He would have to be very settled in himself. He would not have to have either a superiority complex that constantly needs validation or an inferiority complex that needs to be coddled because I'm tired of police officers with guns and batons and tasers talking about I fear for my life and people going for that. Okay, so you're either superior or inferior or you're just a person going out to protect and serve. This would be a mindset change that we don't see as often. But these are ways that we can talk about this issue in terms of what do you need in a police department? What should we be asking for when we go and we ask police departments to reform themselves? What kind of people do we need to see applying for the jobs and what kind of training should they have? Again, we can always talk about what we don't want, but it's a different idea to talk about what we do. Now, then you come to the situation, you have the police officers that you have. So how do you be a good cop in the kind of situation where you see your partner getting ready to put his knee on somebody's neck? Or as poor Ironwood Hamilton wakes up one fine morning and has to deal with, what happens when a big newspaper comes through and is demanding records that are going to embarrass the police department of your entire county? How do you deal with the conflict between the blue line? Now, Captain Hamilton comes from a military background, so he's actually very new being a police officer, but he understands how this works because he's from a veteran background. The first thing you're supposed to do is protect the unit and protect your fellow soldiers. So that fits right in with the blue line. What's he going to, how is he going to be a good cop in this situation? Now, I'm not going to tell you the answer because the book is available for you to pick up for free until midnight tonight. And also the paperback is on discount. But what I do want you to know is this, in the same way that we don't generally have this conversation, guess who has to figure this out? This is at the end of chapter two. Guess who has to figure this out? He has to figure this out. And I, what Hamilton is honest enough to tell, to tell the world what the rest of us are kind of having to say. He does not have a clue what he is going to do with this. He has to learn in situation how to be a good police officer in the middle of a racial conflict between his fellow white police officers and the entire black community in Lofton County. And so we haven't had these conversations. So what this book presents is a way of thinking how would people even work their way it is a possible it presents a possible answer but he has to work his way through just like we in the united states have to work our way through it is probably not going to be effective long term to tell police officers that we want to shut their entire departments down because the problem is you do have to have some kind of law enforcement now that's not going to work as well, but we're not going to see that until later. But now that the federal government has gone home and defaulted on making sure that people have the resources that they need, trust me on this, you, we might need some good officers to come through and help us when strong arms and big bricks make up for the fact that people cannot get the resources they need because they are out of money. You might need a police officer. Then a whole bunch of them are going to be ticked off and have already said, we're not going to even bother to police certain neighborhoods. Now, that's dereliction of duty, but the reason they can get away with that is because the entire federal government has walked out the door and left the people to destitution. So you're going to see similar behavior. That's on them, but I'm just saying not completely defunding police departments may not be the way to go. But in talking about how things need to be restructured, let's talk about some things we want to see, the kind of men that we want to see and the kind of women that we would like to see on the force in the community. They should be settled in who they are. They shouldn't have big ego problems, big ego wounds. It makes them unstable. 
they shouldn't be of the background if they're patrolling the black community. Maybe we don't necessarily want to have all the officers that served in areas where they were always having to kill dark skinned people to do their mission because again, PTSD is real. Or we need to put money aside and need to get the federal government to be like, if we are going to put veterans on our police forces, let's also get these veterans the resources they need so they don't go back to war inside the community. In this book, in chapter six, you find out that Ironwood Hamilton and his cousin Captain Lee are aware of the fact that, well, actually five and six, they are aware when they actually confront these black men who are taking no nonsense and meeting them for the first time that they have to come out of this war mindset. So you have that kind of thing going on. And then what do you do with situations develop? Every man is responsible for his own actions in the moment that they happen. But here's the deal about police officers and every other human being, including you and me. Whatever your character is at the moment of crisis, that is who you are. The kind of people who are arguing back and forth about whether you should wear a mask or whether you should not wear a mask had a very different opinion about governmental authority in their lives before COVID-19. And because they had this opinion before COVID-19, it manifests itself in this argument about mask or no mask. Some people are more inclined to take a to take an order, even though it is highly inconvenient to stay at home, to wear a mask, to completely change their behavior beforehand. And other people were less inclined because they believe government should not be doing anything but basic infrastructure tasks and they ought to be free to do whatever they darn well please at any time. Pandemic be darned. But that attitude already existed. The thing about policing is this. A police officer can be no better than the person that he is. So we need to look at Okay, what kind of people are coming to protect and serve us? Do they have a racist mindset? We want someone that has respect for all people and has demonstrated this. We want someone who is secure in his ego. That would be helpful. But still, like I said, this person has to have some record of having done, have lived like this, because otherwise, you, when the crisis comes, when you see your fellow officer for nine minutes, putting his knee on someone else's neck. Either you have the character to stop that or you do not. And these are some of the conversations, some of the concepts that are explored in my book, but also concepts that we as a community need to discuss in terms of not only do we want certain behaviors stopped, we need that legacy of 401 years of police officers patrolling us like we're pieces of meat to be moved here and there at their realm or the realm of powerful property owners. That needed to stop 401 years ago, but that's water under the bridge. That's done. But from here, we need that stop. But then what else do we need? That is to say, what do we want to see as the new officers get coming to the academy, as new officers get on the beat? What do we as a community have to say as we find a way to some communities are not going to welcome new officers just because of the history of the way things are. And before those of you who are now more on the right side, right wing, I mean, understand that for 20 generations, 20 generations, and for a brief, for a brief but long enough period there, police officers everywhere, north, south, and west, were just grabbing up black people talking about you contraband and could be used to go put even free black people into the slavery that they were not in. So some communities are never going to be able to be quite as open and welcoming. As I close, let me say this. There are good officers out there who are doing everything they can to be on good terms inside their communities. Their stories are not often heard. Their stories are not don't make the news because news is largely about bad news because that's what, what gets people to watch it. They are out there, but we also need them to be more vocal about what it is that they do that needs to be done. A good cop will stand up for the right. Now, I think you'll find out, because I'm the one writing the story, I think you're going to find out that when you do read Black and White and Red all over, that although I would Hamilton, being a Southern Virginia, born there, has to work his way to knowing the right thing to do. 
even with a Christian background, he's never faced this situation, even though he has a uh, he has a love for all people because he is a devout Christian in that sense that he does understand that if all men were made by God, that they are worthy of the respect of being made in the image of God. He still, because he's trained to think about the needs of the unit, and he's now a police officer, has to work his way to the correct conclusion. I think you're going to like the conclusion that he comes up with. Again, the book is available for you free today until midnight. It's 2.32 in the afternoon as I'm finishing this recording. If you are on Hive, you will see this at 6 o'clock Pacific time. So it'll be, so give six hours from when you see this on Hive. Um, if you get it at the time that it comes on, it should come on Hive at 6 o'clock Pacific. So you would still have six hours. However, as I will be saying next week, although the promotion will be over, this book, I believe, will be worth the time. It is a wonderful mystery for you to read along and try to solve as you go. But it also discusses concepts that you can take into your real life if you are a freedom-loving person in America who believes in the freedom of all people. If you're not, this book may make you mad. You may need to read it anyway to see what the rest of us are thinking but we're going to keep on thinking and moving no matter what you think about it but you also may learn that it's not necessary to see your freedom as having to come as the expense of everybody else so a little controversy is good for you sometimes the book is on discounted paperback and next month in September Lord willing I will have copies that I can make signed copies available. I talked to Dr. Joe Canton yesterday on the phone. What a wonderful conversation. We've been trying to connect for a while. Dr. Canton, when you see this, it was so lovely to talk to you. And your signed copy will be on the way just as soon as I get those. Mr. Austin Longscott, my journalism professor, who helped me to learn about the power of newspapers and black newspapers through history. Your signed copy, if you see this, is on the way. And if anyone else would like one, leave me a comment in any of these discussions, past, present, or future. Everyone, please have a lovely day. Have a beautiful weekend. We'll be back with another concept discussion, even more controversial, next week. We talked about what a good cop looks like. And next week, we're going to talk about something else we don't talk about and we don't see often enough. A powerful black... What would happen if black men could walk around as free and as easy and as powerful as white men in this country? And what happens... Because in this book, they decide to do that. What does that even look like? Should the white people be scared? Are the black people going to get strung up and lynched or shot and mutilated to dare do that? You'll have to pick up the book, but we'll talk about some of the concepts. And this will also be a day that I will talk about the powerful black men that I know who have already decided to do this and walk amongst you. And there are many of them in the world. You just don't necessarily, they're not dumb. They don't necessarily come out and flaunt everything they're doing. But men like my father and my grandfathers and my uncles and our family friends that have allowed me to be the forward speaking, forward thinking black woman that I am, they exist. We're going to talk about it. Again, have a lovely day. And again, the book is available for you until midnight Pacific time today. And afterwards, it's at a, it's at a valued but reasonable price, and I think you're going to enjoy it. Have a lovely day, and I'll see you next week, Lord willing. Goodbye.